Welcome to the 1662 Fellowship of North America, where we promote the historic Anglican formularies as the theological center of gravity for Orthodox Anglicanism in North America. I am Isaac Rayberg, the Archdeacon for Liturgy in the Anglican Diocese of All Nations and the Rector of All Saints Anglican Church in San Antonio, Texas. Today is episode seven of our podcast, and we're going to continue our series that I'm calling the Book of Common Prayer Vision, and we're going through uh, some of the essential elements of Archbishop Cranmer's preface to the original Book of Common Prayer in 1549. That's also included in the 1662 as an essay concerning the service of the church. So last time we introduced that preface, that preface from 1549, gave you a little bit of background on Archbishop Cranmer himself, and we talked about how Archbishop Cranmer Um, saw the prayer book as a return to ancient patterns, return to the fathers. Today we're going to talk about how scripture plays into that vision. So Cranmer argues that the fathers wanted scripture to be read through every year in the public worship of the the service of the church. Um, He writes this in the preface. "For, For they so ordered the matter that all the whole Bible, or the greatest part thereof, should be read over once every year, intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers in the congregation, should, by often uh, reading and meditation in God's word, be stirred up to godliness. And he goes on to describe what that looks like. And um, this is very likely a reference to the patterns we see in uh, St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom, where they did systematically preach through books of the Bible, um, we have many of those sermons still with us, um, and so the uh, and that was in the context of public worship. So they would read and they would preach and they would read and they would preach. And to this day, you'll find a lot of preachers quote from Augustine and Chrysostom because we have those old homilies that they wrote. Um, and what Archbishop Cramer tells us is that following this pattern of reading the Bible through in public throughout the year leads to ministers who are stirred up to godliness. Ministers who can exhort their parishioners to godliness and ministers that can confute error, that can, that can combat heresy and error. And he says the people in turn will learn more of God. They will learn about God. They'll learn to love God. They will be, quote, be the more inflamed with the love of his true religion. So unlike the medieval church's corruption of the use of scriptures, Archbishop Cramer says that the the scriptures need to be read publicly in a way that is comprehensive, systematic, and understandable. And so how does the prayer book approach this? Well, we've got several different approaches to scripture. The one that we would encounter the most are the daily offices, those readings for morning and evening prayer. And these are presented in the classical prayer book, um, represented, I would say, in the 1662 International Edition, um, in, a, in a way that is reading systematically through the scriptures. Um, we, we start with Genesis in the Old Testament readings, um, both morning and evening. We have Matthew's Gospel in morning prayer and the epistle to the Romans and evening prayer, and we move through those texts systematically um, through the year, three times through the New Testament, one time through the Old Testament. Now, this is not the entire Bible. There are parts that are left off, and what ends up getting left off are those things that are going to be most confusing without having a preacher to explain it to them. So not everybody has a St. Augustine or a St. Chrysostom that can uh, preach through all those texts. Sometimes, most for most of us, we're just going to be hearing those texts in the daily offices. And so what ends up getting left off are things like the genealogies, some of the minutia of the Old Testament ceremonial law. Um, a lot of the apocalyptic visions are left off because they can be very confusing. Um, parts of the story that are repeated uh, between Kings and Chronicles, we have the Kings version in the, in the lectionary, not the Chronicles version and then that erotic poetry from Song of Songs. But we also have a way that we handle the Psalms. 
The Psalms are not part of that regular cycle, but rather we chant or read or recite the Psalms through every month. We cycle through in morning and evening prayer every month. So that ensures that we have a steady diet of the Psalms. The Psalms are really special when it comes to, to the Bible. Um, this, this is something that the church started doing very, very early on in ancient history, um, largely in the context of the monastery. But the way the prayer book gives it to us is that we get the Psalter regularly, but it's not quite as often through as the monks would have. Uh, in the old days, the monks might go through the Psalter every week. Some of them would go through it almost every day. Um, we're doing it through once a month, something that is doable for regular folk. And also, we're not limiting the Psalms to our favorites. That is what often happened in the medieval church, is they had certain Psalms assigned for certain parts of the day, and the rest of the Psalter was just kind of ignored in the prayer life of the church. So as we're going through the Psalms and the regular reading through the scriptures, um, every now and again, we are going to have to break the pattern for holy days, but we're not going to do that as much as happened in the medieval church. We're limiting those breaking of the readings so that we don't lose the systematic character. So we're going to limit our holy days to the red letter um, commemorations of New Testament saints and events in Jesus' life. Um, and we don't always replace in these classical prayer books all of the readings for the whole day. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it's a special day with, with special readings in all the offices. Sometimes maybe only the, uh, the Old Testament reading or the New Testament reading is replaced. But we also have special readings outside of this cycle for Sundays and Holy Days. So that traditional Eucharistic lectionary, the epistles and the Gospels, that had been, been used at Holy Communion for um, that pattern starts about uh, the year 1000. Um, it reaches its final, or about the year 500 or so, it reaches its final point around the year 1000. And so it had been the standardized for about five centuries in the Western church. That's by and large retained. Maybe a couple of, uh, of, of minor edits to, to, to which verses if it fits the day better. But for the most part, we're maintaining that traditional single-year Eucharistic lectionary. But we're also, the prayer book gives us a cycle of what we call proper Old Testament lessons. So this is outside the normal cycle of Old Testament readings for Sundays and Holy Days. Um, and uh, on Sundays in particular, they do take you through the Old Testament in kind of more of an overview way. So it touches on those themes from the, from the Eucharistic lectionary a bit, but it's, all, it's, it's also to give us an overview of the Old Testament story. And so that's really what the, what the Sunday Eucharistic lectionary with those Old Testament proper lessons do, is we get an overview of the Bible story, kind of those, those greatest hits, and then we're getting the details in the daily offices. Now, unfortunately, every time the prayer book was edited, and sometimes um, even during the life of the same prayer book, there's edits that are made to the daily office lectionary. The, uh, unfortunately, what ends up happening almost every time is that more and more scripture is left out. Um, one of the most uh, uh, stunning blows to this happens in the early 20th century where we start we move from having a calendar year approach to the daily office lectionary, where it's always the same on January 1st, January 2nd, etc., to one that's based on the church year. And um, because of the way that Easter moves around, there's some weeks that you don't see very often. So, you know, that desire to have a church year only based daily reading, it kind of um, will, will naturally hurt that systematic approach to the scriptures that Archbishop Cramer wanted to restore. Um, the readings get shorter. Uh, largely in this original version of the 1662, we have whole chapters. Now we start to do partial chapters. Um, there's fewer Psalms. Uh, the stuff that maybe makes us a little bit uncomfortable, we start to leave out. And um, that's a real problem. Uh, in the, th this is one area where the ACNA's 2019 Book of Common Prayer did a really good job 
um, they restored a more comprehensive approach to scripture um, while, while keeping some of the flexibility that um, as diverse a province as the ACNA is needed. Um, I, I think it's a little bit more complex than the old 1662 lectionary, but it does have more scripture, so you have that. So my recommendation would be, if you're in a parish or you're, you're in your family, use one of the classical editions of the prayer book. So um, in the American context, that would include our 1928, uh, the 1965 from Canada, uh, 1662 from England. I would use that original daily office lectionary that's published in the international edition. Um, you can find that online um, on their resources page. Um, if you're using one of the more modern revisions, those post-1970s revisions of the prayer book, such as the 2019 or the one from the Church of Nigeria, I'd recommend adopting the ACNA 2019 daily office lectionary for that. And the reason why I would, I would recommend two tracks is because there are some slight calendar differences that make uh, bringing in um, the 1662 difficult for those later editions or using that 2019 in older versions it makes it a bit more difficult but either year either way the point is we want to approach scripture systematically and we want to approach scripture comprehensively we want to feast on the bible the prayer book really is a vehicle for giving us the holy scriptures in the context of public and private prayer and so let's, uh, let's take up and read uh, the Holy Scriptures. Next time we're going to look at the, uh, the third part of this prayer book vision, and that is simplicity, a simple approach to common prayer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and please do hit like and subscribe if this has been edifying. God bless.